papacy, while on the papacy, next to Christianity, is the great fact of the modern world, fully to trace the rise and development of this stupendous system, were to write a history of Western Europe, the decay of empires, the extinction of religious systems, the dissolution and renewal of society, the rise of new states, the change of manners, customs, and laws, the policy of courts, the wars of kings, the decay and revival of letters, of philosophy, and of arts, all connect themselves with the history of the papacy, to whose growth they ministered, and whose destiny they helped to unfold. The Papacy, Rev. J. A. Wiley, p. 1, Edinburgh, Johnston and Hunter, 1851, Papacy. It is impossible to deny that the polity of the Church of Rome is the very masterpiece of human wisdom. In truth, nothing but such a polity could, against such assaults, have borne up such doctrines. The experience of 1200 eventful years, the ingenuity and patient care of 40 generations of statesmen, have improved that polity to such perfection that, among the contrivances that have been devised for deceiving and oppressing mankind, it occupies the high tea place. Lord Macaulay, in his essay on Rank's History of the Popes of Rome, par. 33, The Rise of the Papacy, from the persecuted head of an insignificant local church to the supreme domination over both the spiritual and the temporal hierarchy of Europe, is one of the most curious problems in history. Studies in Church History, Henry G. Lee, p. 112, Philadelphia, Henry C. Lee's Son & Co., 1883, Papacy revealed by inspiration. The Roman papacy is revealed by the raw reopening light of the divinely written word. Its portrait is painted, its mystery is penetrated, its character, its deeds are drawn, its thousand veils and subterfuges are torn away. The unsparing hand of inspiration has stripped it, and left it standing upon the stage of history deformed and naked, a dark emanation from the pit, blood-stained and blasphemous blindly struggling in the concentrated rays of celestial recognition, amid the premonitory thunders and lightnings of its fast approaching doom. Romanism and the Reformation, H. Grattan Guinness, D. D. F. R. A. S. P. P. 83, 84, London, J. Nisbet & Co., 1891, Papacy, Prophecies Concerning. There are three distinct sets of prophecies of the rise character, deeds, and doom of Romanism. The first is found in the book of Daniel, the second in the epistles of Paul, and the third in the letters and apocalypse of John, and no one of these 328 papacy, Daniel's view of. Three is complete in itself. It is only by combining their separate features that we obtain the perfect portrait. Just as we cannot derive from one gospel a complete life of Christ, but in order to obtain this must take into account the records in the other three, so we cannot from one prophecy gather a correct account of Antichrist, we must add to the particulars given in one those supplied by the other two. Some features are given in all three prophecies, just as the death and resurrection of Christ are given in all four Gospels. Others are given only in two, and others are peculiar to one, as might be expected from the position and training of the prophet who was a statesman and a governor in Babylon. Daniel's foreview presents the political character and relations of Romanism. The Apostle Paul's foreview, on the other hand, gives the ecclesiastical character and relations of this power, and John's prophecies, both in Revelation 13 and 17, present the combination of both, the mutual relations of the Latin Church and Roman state. He uses composite figures, one part of which represents the political aspect of Romanism as a temporal government, and the other its religious aspect as an ecclesiastical system. Romanism and the Reformation, H. Grattan Guinness, D. D. F. R. A. 8. P. 7. London, J. Nisbet & Co., 1891. Papacy, Daniel's View of. The papacy has existed for 13 centuries has had to do with 40 or 50 generations of mankind in all the countries of Christendom. Its history is consequently extremely complicated and various. It embraces both secular and ecclesiastical matters, and has more or less to do with all that has happened in Europe since the fall of the old Roman Empire. The time is long, the sphere vast, the story exceedingly complex. I want you to tell it all, in outline at least, 
In a narrative that you could read in less than 5 minutes or write in 10, you must bring in every point of importance, the time and circumstances of the origin of the papacy, its moral character, its political relations, its geographical seat, its self-exalting utterances and acts, its temporal sovereignty, and a comparison of the extent of its dominions with those of the other kingdoms of Europe, its blasphemous pretensions, its cruel and long-continued persecutions of God's people, the duration of its dominion, its present decay, and the judgments that have overtaken it, and you must, moreover, add what you think its end is likely to be, and explain the relation of the whole history to the revealed plan of divine providence. You must get all this in, not in the dry style of an annual time summary of the events of the year, but in an interesting, vivid, picturesque style, that will impress the facts on the memory, so that to forget them shall be impossible. Can you do it? I might safely offer a prize of any amount to the person who can solve this puzzle and write this story as I have described, but hard, even impossible, as it would be for you to DP this, even if you perfectly knew the history of the last 13 centuries. How infinitely impossible would it be if that history lay in the unknown and inscrutable future, instead of in the past and present? If no I had seen, nor ear heard it, if it was an untraversed continent, an unseen world, a matter for the evolution of ages yet to come, who then could tell the story at all, much less in brief? Now this is precisely what the prophet Daniel, by inspiration of the omniscient and eternal God, has done. He told the whole story of the papacy 25 centuries ago. He omitted none of the points I have enumerated, and yet the prophecy only occupies 17 verses of a chapter which can be read slowly and impressively in less than 5 minutes. This is because it is written in the only language in which middle dot papacy, contradictions of, 329 it is possible thus to compress multum in parvo, much in little, the ancient language of hieroglyphics. God revealed the future to Daniel by a vision in which he saw, not the events, outliving, moving, speaking hieroglyphics of the events. These Daniel simply describes, and his description of them constitutes the prophecy written in the seventh chapter of his book, Romanism and the Reformation H. Graden Guinness, D. D. F. R. A. 8, pp. 20, 21. London, J. Nisbet & Co., 1891. Papacy, Age and Vigor of. There is not, and there never was on this earth, a work of human policy so well deserving of examination as the Roman Catholic Church. The history of that church joins together the two great ages of human civilization. No other institution is left standing which carries the mind back to the times when the smoke of sacrifice rose from the Pantheon and when camelopards and tigers bounded in the Flavian Amphitheater. The proudest royal houses are but of yesterday, when compared with the line of the Supreme Pontiffs. That line we trace back in an unbroken series from the Pope who crowned Napoleon in the 19th century to the Pope who crowned Pepin in the 8th, and far beyond the time of Pepin the August dynasty extends, till it is lost in the twilight of fable. The Republic of Venice came next in antiquity, but the Republic of Venice was modern when compared with the papacy and the Republic of Venice is gone, and the papacy remains. The papacy remains, not in decay, not a mere antique, but full of life and useful vigor. The Catholic Church is still sending forth to the farthest ends of the world missionaries as zealous as those who landed in Kent with Augustine, and still confronting hostile kings with the same spirit with which she confronted Attila. The number of her children is greater than in any former age. Her acquisitions in the New World have more than compensated for what she has lost in the Old. Her spiritual ascendancy extends over the vast countries which lie between the plains of the Missouri and Cape Horn, countries which, a century hence, may not improbably contain a population as large as that which now inhabits Europe. The members of her communion are certainly not fewer than 150 millions, and it will be difficult to show that all other Christian sects united amount to 120 millions. Nor do we see any sign which indicates that the term of her long dominion is approaching. She saw the commencement of all the governments and of all the ecclesiastical establishments that now exist in the world and we feel no assurance that she is not destined to see the end of them all. She was great and respected before the Saxon had set foot on Britain, before the Frank had passed the Rhine, when Gershine eloquence still flourished in Antioch, 
when idols were still worshipped in the temple of Mecca, and she may still exist in undiminished vigor when some traveler from New Zealand shall, in the midst of a vast solitude, take his stand on a broken arch of London Bridge to sketch the ruins of Street Paul's. Lord Macaulay in his essay on Rank's History of the Popes of Rome, Papacy, A Mystery of Contradictions. Who can measure it, the papacy, or analyze it, or comprehend it? The weapons of reason appear to fall impotent before its haughty dogmatism, genius cannot reconcile its inconsistencies, serenely it sits, unmoved amid all the aggressions of human thought and all the triumphs of modern science, it is both lofty and degraded, simple, yet worldly wise, humble, yet scornful and proud, washing beggars' feet, yet imposing commands on the potentates of earth, benignant, yet severe 330 papacy, essence of on all who rebel, here clothed in rags, and there reveling in palaces, supported by charities, yet feasting the princes of the earth, assuming the title of servant of the servants of God, yet arrogating the highest seat among worldly dignitaries. Was there ever such a contradiction? Glory in debasement and debasement in glory, type of the misery and greatness of man? Was there ever such a mystery, so occult are its arts, so subtle its policy? so plausible its pertinence, so certain its shafts, how imposing the words of paternal benediction, how grand the liturgy brought down from ages of faith, how absorbed with beatific devotion appears to be the worshipper at its consecrated altars, how ravishing the music and the chants of grand ceremonials, how typical the churches and consecrated monuments of the Passion of Christ, everywhere you see the great emblem of our redemption, on the loftiest pinnacle of the medieval cathedral on the dresses of the priests, over the gorgeous altars, in the ceremony of the Mass, in the baptismal rite, in the paintings of the side chapels, everywhere rites and emblems betokening maceration, grief, sacrifice, penitence, the humiliation of humanity before the awful power of divine omnipotence, whose personality and moral government no Catholic dares openly to deny. Dot. And yet, of what crimes and abominations has not this government been accused? If we go back to darker ages, and accept what history records, what wars has not this church encouraged, what discords has she not incited, what superstitions has she not endorsed, what pride has she not arrogated, what cruelties has she not inflicted, what countries has she not robbed, what hardships has she not imposed, what deceptions has she not used? What avenues of thought has she not guarded with a flaming sword? What truth has she not perverted? What goodness has she not mocked and persecuted? Ah, interrogate the Albigenses, the Waldenses, the shades of Jerome of Prague, of Huss, of Savonarola, of Cranmer, of Colligny, of Galileo. Interrogate the martyrs of the Thirty Years' War, and those who were slain by the Dragonades of Louis XIV, those who fell by the hand of Alva and Charles IX, go to Smithfield and Paris on street, Bartholomew, think of gunpowder plots and inquisitions, and Jesuit intrigues and Dominican tortures, of which history accuses the papal church, barbarities worse than those of savages, inflicted at the command of the ministers of a gospel of love. Dot. As for the supreme rulers of this contradictory church, so benevolent and yet so cruel, so enlightened and yet so fanatical, so humble and yet so proud, this institution of blended piety and fraud, equally renowned for saints, theologians, statesmen, drivelers, and fanatics, the joy and the reproach, the glory and the shame of earth, there never were greater geniuses or greater fools, saints of almost preternatural sanctity, like the first Leo and Gregory, or hounds like Boniface VIII or Alexander of I, an array of scholars and dunces, ascetics and gluttons, men who adorned and men who scandalized their lofty position. Beacon Lights of History, John Lord, LL.D., Volume, V, pp. 99-102, New York, James Clark and Company, Papacy, Essence of. The supremacy is the essence of the whole Roman system. Take away the assertion of Street, Peter's supremacy and the Pope's equal power as his successor, and the Roman Church is Roman and Imperial no longer. It is then no more to the rest of Christendom than the Church of Ethiopia or Armenia would be, except so far as one branch might be more pure, enlightened, or efficient than another. The rise of the papal power Robert Hussey, B. Z. M. Preface, P. 30, Oxford, 
the Clarendon Press, 1863 A Papacy, culmination of, papacy, offspring of man. No one can study the development of the Italian ecclesiastical power without discovering how completely it depended on human agency, too often on human passion and intrigues, how completely wanting it was of any mark of the divine construction and care, the offspring of man, not of God, and therefore bearing upon it the lineaments of human passions, human virtues, and human sins. History of the Intellectual Development of Europe, John William Draper, M. D. Comma LL. D. Volume. I. P. 382. New York, Harper and Brothers, 1876. Papacy, Jothav. We undertake to trace the story of the Romancy from the earliest evidence that can be found, to show that in the primitive times there neither existed in fact, nor was claimed as of right, any such supremacy as that which the See of Rome now claims. We undertake to show how the Roman power advanced step by step in age after age, until at length, not by any prerogative divinely conferred on it from the beginning, but by a slow, gradual, and distinctly traceable progress, by means which, without forgetting the overruling control of the divine providence, we may call simply natural, it attained its great estate fullness under such popes as Gregory VII in the latter half of the 11th century, and Innocent III in the beginning of the 13th. Plain Lectures on the Growth of the Papal Power, James Gray G. Robertson, M. A. P. P. 4. 5. London, Society for Promoting Christian Knowledge. The History of the Growth of the Papal Power, I. E. Popery, properly so called, exhibits clearly the rise and progress of a worldly principle within the Church. Setting out from an acknowledged precedence among equals in rank, possessing from the first an actual influence well earned by distinguished merit, Rome proceeded by degrees to the fictions of street, Peter's supremacy, and the Pope's inheritance of a divine right to govern the whole church. When we observe how these doctrines, unheard of in primitive ages, were first obscurely intimated, then more broadly asserted, after this perpetually referred to, introduced into every opening, never omitted, but every incident taken advantage of, and all circumstances dexterously turned into an argument to support them, how succeeding popes never retracted, but adopted and uniformly improved upon the pretensions of their predecessors, how an innocent went beyond a Julius, as Leo beyond innocent, and a Gregory VII, in later times, overshot him, when we see the care and anxiety with which popes seem in all things, and sometimes above all things, to have provided for the security of their own authority and how this end was carried out by interpolations and falsification of ecclesiastical documents, which, when detected, were never retracted or disavowed, and somewhat later grew into a notorious and scandalous system of forgery. When we weigh all these things, it seems impossible for unprejudiced readers to acquit the papal seat of the charge of worldly ambition and corrupt motives. The Rise of the Papal Power, Robert Hussey, B. D. P. P. 148, 149, Oxford, The Clarendon Press, 1863, Papacy, Culmination of Apostasy. The history of the Christian Church does not record a steady progress in the pathway of truth and holiness, and an interrupted spread of the Kingdom of God on earth. On the contrary, it tells the story of a tremendous apostasy. Even in the first century, as we learn from the New Testament, there set in a departure from the Gospel and a return to certain forms of ritualism, as among the Galatians. In the 2nd and 3rd centuries, anti-Christian doctrine and anti-Christian practices, sacramentarianism and Sasser 332 papacy, supremacy of dotalism, invaded the church, and gradually climbed to a commanding position, which they never afterwards abandoned. In the 4th century, with the fall of paganism, began a worldly, imperial Christianity, wholly unlike primitive apostolic Christianity, a sort of Christianized hedonism, and in the 5th and 6th centuries sprang up the papacy, in whose career the apostasy culminated later on. Romanism in the Reformation, H. Grattan Guinness, D. D. F. R. A. S. P. P. 60, 61, London, J. Nisbet & Co., 1891, Papacy. Five Steps in the Development of The Papal Power was gradually developed, 
and it is not difficult to trace the principal steps of its development. First step, the influence of the pseudo-Clementine letters and homilies, a forgery probably of the middle of the second century. These writings profess to be from the hand of Clemens Romanus, who writes to James after the death of Peter, and states that the latter shortly before his death appointed the writer his successor. Here we have the origin of the story, repeated by Church Elian, that Clement was ordained Bishop of Rome by Street, Peter. The Bishop of Manchester is of opinion that the whole early persuasion of Street, Peter's Roman Episcopate was due to the acceptance in the third and following centuries of the Clementine fiction as genuine history. No one had any suspicion that the Clementine romance was a lie invented by a heretic. The story was accepted on all sides. With this view coincides the encyclical letter of the Holy Orthodox Church of the East already referred to. Those absolutistic pretensions of popedom were first manifested in the pseudo-Clementines. Second step, the action of the Council of Sardica, A.D. 343, in giving a right of appeal to the Bishop of Rome on the part of any bishop who considered himself unjustly condemned. This led to the consolidation of power in the hands of the Bishop of Rome. Although the decree of the council was not accepted by the churches of Africa or the East. Third step. The decree of the Emperor Valentinian I, that all ecclesiastical cases arising in churches in the empire should be henceforth referred for adjudication to the Bishop of Rome. Fourth step. The appeals provided for by the Council of Sardica and by the decree of Valentinian were voluntary appeals, by Pope Nicholas I, in the 9th century, set up the claim that, with or without appeal, the Bishop of Rome had an inherent right to review and decide all cases affecting bishops. Fifth step, the forged Isidorian decretals, which pretended to be a series of royal orders, and letters of ancient bishops of Rome, represented that primitive Christianity recognized in the bishops of Rome supreme authority over the church at large. They became a strong buttress and bulwark of the vast powers now claimed by the popes in the person of Nicholas I. Romanism in the light of history. Randolph H. McKim, D. C. L. P. P. 97, 98, New York, G. P. Putnam, S. Sons, 1914, Papacy, the first essay of papal usurpation. But what most of all distinguished the pontificate of Victor was the famous controversy about the celebration of Easter, between the Eastern and Western bishops, the former keeping that solemnity on the fourteenth day of the first moon on what day soever of the week it happened to fall, and the latter putting it off till the Sunday following. Dot. Victor, not satisfied with what his two immediate predecessors had done, took upon him to impose the Roman custom on all the churches that followed the contrary practice. But, in this bold attempt, which we papacy and Rome, 333 may call the first essay of papal usurpation, he met with a vigorous and truly Christian opposition. The History of the Pope's Archibald Bauer, Volume I, P. 18, Philadelphia, Griffith and Simon, 1847, Papacy, Formal Claim to Supremacy by The Supremacy of the See of Rome began in the 4th century. Then for the first time the precedence among equals willingly conceded to Rome in early ages was turned into a claim of authority, which was demanded on a new ground, and from that time never ceased to advance in pretensions until it assumed the form of the supremacy, that is, absolute dominion throughout Christendom. The rise of the papal power Robert Hus C. B. D. P. 1. Oxford, The Clarendon Press, 1863. Papacy, Effect of Removal of Capital from Rome to Constantinople. The removal of the capital of the empire from Rome to Constantinople in 330, left the Western Church practically free from imperial power to develop its own form of organization. The Bishop of Rome, in the seat of the Caesars, was now the greatest man in the West, and was soon forced to become the political as well as the spiritual head. To the Western world Rome was still the political capital, hence the whole habit of mind, all ambition, pride, and sense of glory, and every social prejudice favored the evolution of the great city into the ecclesiastical capital. Civil as well as religious disputes were referred to the successor of Peter for settlement. Again and again, when barbarians attacked Rome, he was compelled to actually assume military leadership. Eastern emperors frequently recognized the high claims of the popes in order to gain their assistance. It is not difficult to understand how, under these responsibilities, 
the primacy of the Bishop of Rome, established in the pre-Constantine period, was impnacized and magnified after 313, Edict of Milan, the importance of this fact must not be overlooked. The organization of the Church was thus put on the same divine basis as the revelation of Christianity. This idea once accepted led inevitably to the medieval papacy. The rise of the medieval Church Alexander Clarence Flick, Ph.D. Lit. D. pp. 168-169 New York, G. P. Putnam's Sons, 1909